from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you, welcome back. Um, we are going to now turn to a related but slightly separate topic. We've had, um, as I mentioned earlier, a really informative and lively discussion of orphan works, but primarily looking at orphan works from the context of a uh, case-by-case basis. And so now we wanted to touch base with you uh, more broadly on, about the concept of mass digitization. As many of you may know, in our 2011 report on legal issues in mass digitization, we, we discussed the landscape at that time of mass digitization projects and raised a series of questions that should be considered in any policy discussion about mass digitization, including whether mass digitization is something worthy of congressional support due to either historical or cultural significance. Of course, since that time, the Hathi Trust and Google Books cases were decided by the Southern District of New York, which have permitted mass digitization under current law of fair use at least for certain uh, reasons and in certain context. Uh, those cases, however, as most of you know, are on appeal, and neither involved large-scale public access to the work at, works at issue or the type of institutional subscription database uh, considered in the Google Books settlement. So our legal issues and masterization analysis document also considered various licensing models that might facilitate masterization projects, including direct licensing, statutory licensing, and extended collective licensing. ECL is, as most of you know, a form of collective management where the government allows a collective management organization to license all works within a category, such as all literary works, for particular limited uses, regardless of whether the copyright owner owners belong to the collective management organization or not. While it is not currently part of the United States framework, it has been adopted for many years ECL in several Nordic countries, and the United Kingdom recently has also adopted an ECL mechanism in its law for certain uses. And while U.S. law, as I mentioned, has not really been part of the United States fr framework, many academics and others referred to the previous Google Books settlement as a form of ECL, where a books rights registry would have facilitated certain uses of out-of-print books on an opt-out basis and created an unclaimed works fiduciary to search for unlocatable authors. So at least some groups within the United States in this industry, such as certain publishers, authors, and those libraries that would have participated in this subscription database under the Google Books settlement were at least willing to consider or accept a framework for ECL under certain instances. So we wanted to first start off with a consideration of mass digitization generally, and then later we will focus more in more detail about the concept of ECL and whether it's an appropriate framework for the United States to consider um, on a legal basis um, now. And I'll turn it over to Frank for the mass digitization side. Thank you. Frank Muller, Attorney Advisor for Policy and International Affairs at the Copyright Office. And before we begin, if we could go around the table and if each of the panelists could introduce themselves, uh, your name and affiliation, and if I could ask you kindly to turn your name tent toward me so I can see them. Thank you very much. If we could start you. Uh, Blaine Desi, Library of Congress, Library Services Unit. Leah Prescott, Associate Law Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Special Collections at Georgetown Law Library. Corinne McSherry, Corinne McSherry, Intellectual <laughs> Property Director, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Andrew McDermott at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Janice Pilch, Copyright and Licensing Librarian, Rutgers University Libraries. Mickey Ostreicher, National Press Photographers Association. June Bessick, Executive Director of the Kernikan Center for Law, Media, and the Arts at Columbia Law School. Jan Constantine, General Counsel, Authors Guild. Richard Burgess, representing A2IM and not Smithsonian or Smithsonian Folk Race. Uh, Jonathan Band for the Library Copyright Alliance. Ben Scheffner, ben Vice President, Legal Affairs, Motion Picture Association of America. Mike Carroll at the American University of Washington College of Law and also Creative Commons United States. Brooke Penrose, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. 
Melissa Levine, Lead Copyright Officer, University of Michigan Library. Eirik Rudén, Legal Advisor in National Library of Sweden. Thank you. Uh, and just to give us a sense of scope, as Karen mentioned, we are transitioning from uh, an examination of use of orphan works on a case-by-case -case or individual basis to uh, an inquiry into the mass digitization of creative works. While orphan works are very often incidentally included in mass digitization projects, several commenters noted that the issue of mass digitization is altogether a horse of a different color. As a prelim preliminary matter, it may be useful to touch upon a point raised yesterday in uh, the by one of our panelists, which is what exactly is mass digitization? What are what is a definition of the concept and what what is the scope of activities that can be accurately described as the practice of mass digitization? Mr. Carroll. Yeah, so that's an excellent question and an important one because I, I, digitization seems to focus attention on the act of scanning, a format shifting from an analog to a digital format, which is really the wrong place to focus. The focus is, should be on the use of digital collections, right? So the format shifting is clearly a fair use, and so there's, it's sort of not interesting to talk about the scanning. And there are lots of reasons why you might want to invest in that format shifting that, again, don't even uh, uh, apply to the kinds of uses that need licensing. For example, text mining or other kind of computational analysis of digitized collections would fall squarely within either you're not reproducing the work in copies because it's not even a transitory duration to extract the non-copyrightable facts out of that data, or to the extent that you keep a reference copy for the transformative purpose of verifying your results, that's a fair use. So those kinds of acts shouldn't, are, are not of interest, but many people who invest in the format shifting, and it is an expensive process, also have some conception of how the digitized uh, outputs will be used. And, and I do think that's a, a place where we have a conversation about what uses fall within fair use and what fa uses fall within a license solution. Does the lic current licensing market capture those uses that sh should take place, or is there a market failure such that some kind of legislation? So I would say, you know, uses of large-scale uh, large digitized collections is what we're really talking about, and whether we have a problem that requires a legislative solution. And my perception is, oops, my perception is that um, the orphan population within these large-scale digitized collections is not always such a significant piece. So I don't know that the idea of one-off solutions versus uh, mass solutions quite fits when it comes to the use uh, issues. Ms. Bilch. Um, a general definition, I think, of mass digitization that would apply anywhere is that it, uh, it usually refers to efforts by institutions such as libraries and archives to digitize their entire collections or part of their collections with the objective to preserve them and to make them available uh, digitally. Uh, in this country, uh, as we well know, uh, conversations about mass digitization started in 2004 because of the Google effort. And the term itself really comes out of the Google effort, and we're a bit stuck in that, in that model because that's where it came from. Um, you know, the idea when libraries started working with tech companies to get their materials digitized systematically and factory style. At that time, we had the concept of mass digitization, large-scale digitization that wasn't factory style, but digitization of collections as a whole. Um, and then there was also the idea of niche digitization, preservation of individual works and making them available. I think at this point in this country, we can say that the term mass digitization um, you know, was used in the context of Google, Microsoft, Open Content Alliance digitization about systematically scanning works to preserve them, to make them searchable electronically through full text searches, to make them publicly available on the internet in excerpts and eventually in full text. Uh, assimilated to mass digitization is large scale digitization by libraries and archives to make works publicly available on the internet. Um, but I do want to mention one other thing, which is it isn't anymore only about libraries and archives. Um, there's another way to think about mass digitization. I don't suggest we do this, but I'm throwing the idea out. Um, digitization done by the masses. You know, it's not libraries and archives anymore. Lots of people are putting works on the internet, large amounts of them. 
and they're being encouraged to do that. Databases are cropping up uh, all over the place as repositories, not connected with uh, nonprofit libraries and archives. And so another way of looking at it might be digitization done by the mass population. Ms. Constantine. I think digitization without authorization is a violation of fair use, and it's not um, authorized under the copyright law. I would defer to some of the experts like June, who has written extensively on this. I don't think that your definition, Michael, is really, uh, you're assuming that this is all on the up and up. And I think it started out as a Google gotcha they went to the libraries and they said, I'll indemnify you for something that you know and that you've written about. People like Peter Hurdle and others have said, this is not legit. This is not, um, this is a violation of Section 108 and it's a violation of copyright law. And they decided to just take trucks, dump everything in the back of a truck, whether it be public domain, whether it be in copyright, out copyright, in print, out of print, they didn't check whether it was disintegrating or whether there was any um, problem in preservation, and they just <laughs> copied 20 million books in violation of the copyright. And if you think that that is fair use, notwithstanding the fact that, that two judges in a lower court have issued that and it's yet to be decided by the Second Circuit or the Supreme Court, um, just wait for the next lawsuit that we bring against some of you who are using it in different ways than uh, that are being used now by the Hattie Trust and, and by Google. You go one page instead of a snippet, we're after you. This is a violation of copyright law, pure and simple. And, and I would just respond to that, and I think that Michael Carroll will, will want to as well, obviously. Um, <laughs> obviously, there is a dif difference of opinion. There could be a difference of opinion as to whether fair use is appropriate. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're here, quite frankly. Um, should there be a legislative solution if there is a difference of opinion as to whether fair use is appropriate to be able to perhaps um, still foster and facilitate these uses that maybe the Authors Guild would be okay with if they were compensated for um, in a way that would still be efficient and easy to, to do. So that's, that is the, the crux of the conversation right. we are but having today. I, I'm sorry, but we just muddied the waters again, and I want to separate it. I'm sorry, Ms. Constantine, there is no authority for format shifting not being a fair use. You have no authority for the proposition that format shifting is not a fair use. Snippets, pages, access is a separate question, but the act of, of format shifting itself is, is a fair use. Section 108C says what a library can do vis-a-vis -vis making a digital copy out of a print copy. Section 108 is one provision that gives libraries one source of, of, of rights. Section 107 is another source. Um, yes, and I, I, will, I will have to sorry. interrupt because I, I, we can't have a conversation, a d debate about fair use today um, because I think um, the legal scholarship as to what is fair use or what isn't fair use uh, could go on for some, some time and even courts are struggling with that as well. So yes, I think for purposes of the panel, we'll have to assume um, and, and we can throw it out to the panelists, that even if you know, maybe format shifting was fair use, there are certain um, types of mass digitization that I think we could all agree might not um, you know, qualify as fair use, especially the making available aspect of those in some way or form. So the question is, should um, there be some legislative solution? Um, but we, we haven't even gotten to the legislative solution aspect of it, because that's going to be in a later panel. I think right now we're actually just trying to get a, get a grasp of what mass digitization is, what are the types of mass digitization out there. Um, and, and there will be a conversation later, I think, in terms of what legislative solutions we might want to consider. And I'll turn it over to Frank. Ms. McSherry. So, I'm sorry, I, I can't help but uh, agreeing with um, Professor Carroll, but, but we don't have to have that fight. Um, but I do think fair use does cover a vast majority of what we might be talking about here today. But I also do agree that it is more helpful uh, to focus going forward on not so much the, the issue of format shifting, which apparently there's a fight about, although not in the courts, um, but um, making stuff available to the world for reuse and display. Like, if we're going to create databases, what can we do with them? How can we um, get the most public benefit out of those? If we're going, if we have this chance now 
um, in an unprecedented way to preserve our cultural commons and make our cultural commons available um, for use and reuse and study and scholarship, how can we best make that possible? And I think it's a m much more productive if we can kind of keep our focus there. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is we're at the sort of definitional stage is I think it is quite right that when we talk about um, digital, the digitization of our cultural commons, it is quite right that it isn't only about libraries, and nor hopefully is it only about Google and libraries. I think we want a world in which actually lots of different people are um, creating new and wonderful databases for other people to use and reuse. And so if we're going to have any kind of solution or think about where we should go, we should go to a place where you know, a thousand flowers can bloom um, rather than trying to create you know, one or two monopolies. I don't think that's practical, and I don't think that's what we want. Thank you. Ms. Prescott. Uh, in addition to uh, it not being just about libraries and being about individuals, it's not just about published work. So I just wanted to make sure that that gets interjected into the conversation that a lot of times I hear us talking at odds between the concept of collection versus individual object. And I know that this is what this session is about. And in the last session, I know there was a discussion about um, photographers having to register thousands of images that they took at a single event. And the concept of keeping the concept of collection in the in consideration, I think, is even important on that end because if you could consider that collection to be a single entity rather than a thousand individual photographs when the metadata would be identical pretty much anyway. So I think the concept of collection uh, versus individual is important in a lot of ways. And I think that it's important to remember that within the academic universe, the world is, a, is changing drastically when we see elementary school children going off with iPads uh, as part of their education. We know that digital objects are a fundamental part, even now, and will only continue to be. And that as that happens, the published materials will start to, there'll be solutions found. I am confident. Maybe that's overly confident. But it's the unpublished materials that really um, are some of the thorniest issues from a library perspective in terms of mass digitization. It isn't even necessarily the published materials. It's the uh, unique materials that are going to go forward as being of the most value within the academy. So I just wanted to make sure we keep that perspective as well. Mr. Band, Mr. Burgess, and Mr. Osterreicher. So just to, you know, I, I think the issue of mass digitization actually is perhaps a little bit broader than just um, the, the format shifting, even though that that is certainly one context in which we've seen it. And, and certainly the, the word or the phrase mass digitization implies that you are converting something from analog to digital. But I think really the body of cases goes way beyond just Google and, and HathiTrust, and, you know, because those cases are based on other cases that involve digital to digital, uh, you know, the, the Kelly versus Rubisoft, uh, Perfect 10 versus Amazon. Uh, in the iParadigm case, uh, I, I'm not even sure whether that was digital, you know, whether the, all the student papers, they may have originally been uploaded in Word form, you know, in, in Word, so they probably were already digital. So I think, and, and to sort of distinguish, say, okay, well, when <clears throat> we're going to distinguish between just the format shifting as opposed to if the stuff that was ingested was already digital to begin with, I think that's sort of an artificial distinction. I mean, I think the notion is, is we're looking at collections of large amount of information that then is you know, preserved in a digital format, but to some extent that's all behind the curtain, right? And then the question is the uses of those, and certainly I agree with uh, with Mike that that everything sort of behind the curtain. Every case that has looked at this has always said, "Yeah, that's a fair use." Although, the only the, issue the, although I will just point out, I'm sure that um, the authors go would would as well that Hathi Trust and, and obviously Google. Yeah, are no, both but we, on we, have, we have at least three other circuit court decisions that say it's not a problem, as well as you know other courts. Uh, uh, in the other cases that we haven't even talked about, which is you know you know the. the if, if we say in terms of scope and who's doing what, you have 
Reed Elsevier and Thompson who have copied the briefs that all of us in this room have written and then they sell them. They sell the full text, right? They're making that available. And that's, the court has found that to be fair use too. I mean, so that seems to me, you know, go way beyond what anyone else in the room has done uh, or is talking about doing. Uh, but, but, all, you know, but again, the courts have found that too to be fair use. Um, so, but my point is, is that I agree that we need to, we should be looking probably a little bit broader than just the format shifting and, and sort of looking at like the assembling of these large databases. That's one thing, but then the real issue, uh, certainly, you know, and I, you know, the, 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 real, the real issue then, at least certainly from the court's perspective, is what are you doing with that? And, and, and that is, uh, uh, um, and, 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 and then and that's where it starts to get much more complicated. I think, uh, but for uh, the, uh, the Reed Elsevier and West law situation, uh, there really has not been access to full text with the exception of the, for the print disabled in, in Hathi Trust. Um, and, and so, you know, so that, that seems to be uh, till now a big distinction, but certainly with, with Reed Elsevier and Hathi Trust and, 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 and West, I mean, they seem to be going a step further. Mr. Burgess. Actually, further to that, uh, I, I think from A2IM's point of view, um, you know, the, 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 the format shifting is, is one thing, but what we're really concerned about is access. It really comes down to access. What, and, and, and I find it interesting that before we start each one of these sessions, um, everybody in this room gives permission for their, uh, anything they say to be used. And yet, in, in implicit in mass digitization is that it's not okay, it's not creators and owners of copyrights, and in our, our case we're talking about music, don't, would, would forego that right, uh, that I can't even comprehend that, and none of our members can comprehend that. And by the way, in terms of um, uh, you know, the masses digitizing, well, we've had that. That happened uh, 13 years ago, 14 years ago with Napster. And um, now, Napster may, could have possibly been a good thing if there'd been a business model attached to it that flowed money back to the creators and the owners, but there wasn't. And we know, you know, that in the, in the ensuing six or seven years, the music industry lost more than half its value and has never really recovered. So the question, I think, and we talk a lot about the public good, but how are we helping the public good if we're damaging creators and, and owners of copyrights, especially small businesses and small individual um, creators? I think. You know, that, that's really the concern from our perspective is how is this work being used and, 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 and is it in, are we actually able to say yes or no and are we able to be compensated really? Uh, from the point of view of institutions and preservation, we're, we're in support of that. But as I said in the last panel, it needs to be incredibly narrowly defined list of institutions and incredibly narrowly defined list of uses, I think. Mr. Rose, Director. I just want to preface my remarks with, with the fact that I, I'm somewhat precluded in talking in, in specifics because uh, NPPA is also involved with ASMP and a number of other groups in a suit against Google. But, but, but that said, uh, earlier in, in the last panel, it was said we're losing a whole lot of our culture by not being able to put some of this stuff out there. And, and, and I think, you know, part of the mass uh, digitization problem is that I, I think it only adds to the fact that much of the public believes that the internet is the public domain and that anything there is there for the taking. I, I think really one of the underlying th themes here is at least from you know the Google aspect this is more like mass monetization. They've figured out a way of taking all this content and it's a word that I truly dislike Content to me is something that settles in the box, in the bottom of macaroni box. You know, I, I mean, you know, we create works. It's not just content, but unfortunately, that's what it's being seen as these days. It's just more and more and more uh, content going out there. In, in terms of addressing some of the cases, you know, Plessy v. Ferguson was the law of the land for 100 years, but that didn't make it right. So just because we can uh, look at these things a, a, as courts deciding what's right now. Uh, I, I think you know the the bottom line is really if we expect to have um, 
a culture, then the creators now s somehow need to be compensated in a way to, that they can earn a living. Um, and, and that's really all we're asking for here. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Pinrose. Yeah, I'm glad uh, Section 108 was mentioned earlier because it seems that the purpose of Section 108 really was to enable um, repositories of material, um, specifically cultural heritage material, to be accessible to a wide amount of people. And the reality is um, there, are, there are more than libraries and archives that are serving that purpose now. Museums are not addressed in Section 108 um, or Section 504C2. Uh, and that seems to be an oversight and something that perhaps would allow us to um, move forward with um, enabling more access to our content. Um, going back though to the question on what is mass digitization, I think what mass digitization from our stance really is, is recognizing that we have a duty to a community beyond our brick and mortar building. We have a duty to provide access to a collection of hundreds of thousands of works to a global community. Um, beyond that global community and uh, recognizing that we um, are serving a community beyond people that can physically visit our building, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces of work that aren't going to be on our floor at any given time. We have hundreds of thousands of works, and we can fit maybe 10,000 works in our galleries. Uh, in order to provide meaningful access to our entire collection, those works have to live online. Um, and until we're able to do that, they're sitting in our basement. Uh, you know, no one's going to see them. No one knows that they're around. Um, so it's really critical that we're able to engage in those activities. Thank you. Ms. Bizek? I have to say, um, I came in here with some prepared remarks, but we went so quickly um, from uh, digitization from libraries to individuals, um, beyond digitization for certain uses that don't uh, involve full text display to um, you know, uses that do, uh, assumptions of public benefits, and it, you know, it, all of a sudden we're really not limiting it in any way. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, mass digitization uh, in the context of the Hathi Trust and the Google cases, which involved comprehensive uh, digitization of collections for purposes of search, text mining, et cetera, where um, the works are not used for the substance of what's in them in the sense that they're not provided to uh, the public, or at least to the general public, in full text form. And currently, that's being done in reliance on fair use, although, as has been pointed out, those cases are still early days yet. So um, if that is kind of what we're thinking about, uh, I think these other things show what a slippery slope fair use is. And if that's the way we go ahead, I think there's a lot of danger in this going far more, uh, far beyond what I think anybody ever envisioned. That's why, unfortunately, I think that legislation really is appropriate to try to um, regulate what may be a public benefit, but not let it go too far in the other direction. So if there were to be legislation, I think that what the things that would have to be looked at is, is the digitization truly providing a public benefit? Um, does the party who's digitizing have the technical capability to do what it says it does? If it's digitizing for preservation, it ought to be able to preserve. And that's not just digitizing. Preservation involves a lot more than that. What level of disclosure can be made? Um, in uh, the Hadi Trust, in the Google cases, we talk about snippets. Well, what about mega snippets? You know, are those allowed? Um, paragraphs, pages. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about disclosure in the, uh, the Google cases because um, Google very intelligently combined its two databases, the licensed one and the non-licensed one. So I have to say most of the people that I have spoken to, that is students who say, oh wow, this database is so great, almost invariably are talking about the licensed part of the database where they get a few pages rather than a few words. So what's going to be permitted? Uh, is it for profit or not? What kind of security is being provided? If you're going to do this, you ought to be able to secure the materials that you have. And if you can't, then you ought not to be able to do it. Uh, is opt-out to be permitted? Uh, what if you're already in another database? Because uh, obviously, if there's more than one database that covers the same material, and we've heard here that somebody shouldn't have a monopoly on that database, then does everything have to be in every database? Or if you're in one, do you have to be in the other? Why shouldn't you be able to choose yourself? So these are the things I think we ought to be looking at and determining uh, whether um, 
you know, there should be legislation, what kind of legislation that there should be. Uh, I, I think it's just um, not reasonable to think that uh, a lot of the things that are being discussed here are really more appropriately um, amending the Copyright Act in, in a significantly different way to uh, broaden many of the exceptions or create one new, even broader exception. And, and just to follow up on that, if, if you have any thoughts, I know we, we've kind of been talking really broadly of, about high-level, you know, general general points, but on the mass digitization point, in terms of what it is, um, do you have any thoughts or, you know, again, others in terms of what mass digitization actually is? And if we're looking at a legislative solution uh, to mass digitization, what should that encompass um, and what should be considered to be that? Can I follow up on that question just to tag along a little bit? When um, Karen talks about that, I'm also interested in, are we talking about numbers? Are we talking about types of uses? So are you talking about, obviously, 20 million books? Are you talking about 10 books? Are you talking about it's for preservation or all of those things? And so I think I would be interested in also hearing about that and the definition of what mass digitization is. Mr. Dessie. Thank you. I have a slightly different take on what mass digitization is, and I think we tend to think of it as one solely a technological issue, and I think we somehow have the assumption that it's easy because it's technology. Anyone who undertakes a mass digitization project is making a large financial investment. Having been involved with many of them, it's not a matter of simply putting something on a scanner and it's done. There's a huge amount of work that goes into preparing the collections to be digitized. There's a huge amount of work that goes into the quality control and the inspection of those collections after it's been digitized. So those who are mass digitizing are making their own financial investments in this product. So I think you have to see it as, a, as an economic issue as well. Secondly. I think when people do do mass digitization, there's a value-added proposition to that as well. Uh, again, when I've been involved in mass digitization projects, we are ensuring that uh, we're in all compliance with, with various technological standards for ease of use. We're uh, creating metadata. We're managing version control. We may be developing our own software to search that newly digitized content. Uh, for the federal government, we ensure that everything that's digitized is ADA 508 compliant. So there's a great deal of value added in the process of mass digitization. And I'm not saying that the, the money and the value should drive the conversation, but I think we, we make it too simple if we don't realize how much financial impact there is on the, on the digitizer. And just to, to kind of follow up on that, because I think those are some of the same points that, that uh, June raised in the sense that, you know, when the government, as you said, digitizes it, they really have a, a high level of standards mm -hmm. that they apply. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, making sure that it is ADA compliant. So when you're looking at mass digitization for entities other than the, the federal government, should those, for example, same standards um, be required in order to uh, facilitate that so that um, the mass digitization project is actually has the most, you know, the, the type of public benefit that we would really want it to have? The simple answer is yes. <laughs> Could I just make a point about that? I mean, security, uh, June brought that up. That is such a critical piece of this, and you mentioned that in your last statement. But the problem with a financial um, investment and value is the uh, repercussions if this data is um, hacked into, as we all know has happened in the past, that there are, it, it's compressed and it is uh, taken out of the context of the collection, li like what happened at um, JSTOR, and gets out into the uh, ether where it's replicated perfectly numbers of times and it'll eliminate the market for the creator, totally wipes it out because pirates are able to get their hands on it. So I agree that you know there are certain things that must be tagged onto any kind of project like this in order to prevent that from happening. And I agree that there is value in digitizing and making sure that it's done in a proper way. But if mass digitization occurs 
outside the context of a respectable organization, but um, in the context of a pirate or a niche uh, collector of Civil War books, and they're going to mass digitize 50 of the books that their um, followers want to read, and they just send them out there with no software protection and no cares in the world about uh, market impact, it's a real problem for creators. And Ms. McSherry, then Mr. Schaffner, and Mr. Band. Okay, well, I was going to talk about something else, but if we're moving into DRM, I have to talk about that. No, um, we're not moving into <laughs> DRM. Okay, well, it that's sounded a, a lot a, like that. That's a broad question. Uh, so, oh, good. I'm so glad we're not moving into that. Um, so let me just make two broader points. One is I think it is important when we're talking about, and this is actually partially definitional, I think it's important to keep in mind from the get-go that to the extent that these collections or the works that are digitized or so on are out of print or, of course, orphans, um, I think we need to be smart about how we think about the, the compensation model and how we think about that. Presumably, these are works where there was no commercial uh, aspect of, to them before anyway. They're out of print. They're not commercially available. That's kind of the point. And I think that trying to keep that in mind that actually what may be happening is that now suddenly they are available and maybe there's a new commercial opportunity, but there wasn't one before at all. So let's not lose track of that as we try to think about you know, compensation for creators. And the second thing is I think we're starting to talk a little bit about standards here and if there should be some sort of standards. And I want to just um, give a couple of warnings there that um, I think we should be very careful, especially if we're thinking about legislation down the line. You know, if we bake in technological standards, they're going to be obsolete before the law is passed. I mean, that's just not going to happen, realistically. So I just I want to put that on the table right away. Um, and then secondly, I do think, though, we have a lot of conversations here about security and hacking and worries that you know someone's going to hack into these databases. If we um, require somehow that any database that's created is, you know, comes wrapped in some kind of technological protection measure, we're all re automatically going to make it less usable, less friendly. Um, we're going to undermine ourselves from the, from the get-go and undermine the uh, public interest from the get-go. And finally, I'm sorry, I can't resist suggesting that perhaps we should not compare uh, the um, Hathi Trust decision to Plessy versus Ferguson. Just let's not do that. Mr. Schaffner. Um, thank you, Ben Schaffner with the MPA. I just I want to start off by saying, obviously, there's benefits to mass digitization. That's why people are doing them. That's why we're talking about them. Um, but as the discussion so far has, I think, demonstrated, this is a big, important, and, and complicated public policy um, debate. And there, just as there's benefits, there are drawbacks uh, for creators, if, if not done in the proper way. Um, my concern, as we've seen this debate developing over the last several years, is that we're trying basically to, to you know, pound the, the proverbial uh, square peg into a round hole by discussing this only in the context of fair use. I mean, I think we're all, uh, you know, we all learned in law school about fair, and read all the cases about how fair use is very fact-specific fact and case-by-case. Case. So we're very comfortable with the Second Circuit deciding, you know what, this particular new Jeff Koontz sculpture is fair use and this other one is not. Um, and, and even in a, in a, to take a more recent example, in the, the Cario versus uh, Prince case, I think there were 50-something works at issue. And the court very carefully said, you know what, these uses are fair, these other ones we're not so sure, and we're going to remand to the, to the district court to, to go through, you know, work by work. Then we have the Google Books case and the Hathi Trust case, and we have 20 million books. And the court all of a sudden saying, you know what, 20 million books, and they're doing this big project, seems fair to me. Um, without, n not, not even, and, you know, unrealistic, obviously, to go through 20 million individual case-by-case -case fair use analyses. But you know what? It lumped even broad categories of books together. It, it, evalu it didn't make any distinctions between, um, and to borrow an example that someone else uh, uh, gave to me, it doesn't make any distinction between, you know, a snippet of a romance novel versus a snippet of a travel guidebook where, you know what, if you just want to do a search for hotels in Istanbul, you know what, that snippet is pretty valuable to you in a way that maybe the snippet of a romance novel is not. So anyway, it, it's a good thing that we are discussing this in a broader public policy debate because, again, I think that we are trying to make these broad public policy um, determinations by, having, by individual 
um, you know, district court judges or now appellate judges. Um, and I think it's very, we have to be careful that we don't sort of lump all types of works. I mean, I, I talked about you know, one type of book versus another, but obviously there's a lot of other types of works, including motion pictures, where, you know what, the licensing model is working pretty well. There are, in a sense, mass digitization projects going on now, I'm talking about things like there's license models, things like um, anyclips or movieclips.com, which in a sense allow you to do pretty much what the Google Books project is doing. You can go on, you can search for uh, through metadata, find the clip you want, and use them through a license model that compensates the creator and the, and the other rights holders um, involved. So anyway, again, I, I commend the Copyright Office for undertaking this and putting it in the broader public policy context. Thank you. Ms. Pinrops? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak briefly to um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Desi's um, comments on adding value and, and what repositories can do. Uh, you know, coming from an industry whose business is fine art, we're able to do things with technology that visitors would never be able to do as far as interacting. Um, we're able to do 3D rotations now where a visitor would never be able to pick up a vase and turn it around and flip it upside down. Uh, we're able to take video to show how uh, jewelry and animatronic works can be manipulated, where a visitor would never be able to pick up the original piece of artwork and, and see what the artist's intent really was when they created that. Uh, we're able to do time-lapse videos of installations. We had a work that took three days to install last year, and it was fascinating to be able to watch it in one minute just sort of all go up. So I, I think those are investments that, as repositories, we're, we're happy to make when it adds value. Um, but if we're stopped on the back end because of copyright restrictions, you know, it doesn't serve our purpose. It doesn't seem to serve the purpose of the public. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if it's something, if it's the type of use that was really envisioned by an artist when they originally created the piece of artwork and sold it initially, that they would down the line be able to license it for, um, you know, time-lapsed installations for an educational institution. Mr. Band. Uh, so I'd just like to respond briefly to uh, June's comments about what legislation in this area. And, and when you started to describe some of the kinds of things that would go into the legislation, I said, well, gee, that sort of tracks to some extent the existing factors of, the, uh, uh, of, of Section 107. And it's also hard to imagine how you would come up with legislation that would be really any more specific than what's in 107 and at the same time be at all, you know, future-proof to use uh, 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 consultant slogan, uh, sort of consultant's jargon. Um, I mean, because the point is, is that, you know, we're talking about the nature of projects that, you know, we could, we have no idea in five years what kinds of uses people would like to be making or, or what technology would allow and what we would think of as beneficial in five years or 10 years and so forth. So it's, an, it's very hard to imagine. Whereas the beauty of Section 107 is that, uh, especially you know, with, with respect to the first factor and the fourth factor, the courts can, looking at a specific project, they can say, okay, what is the purpose of this project and is this you know, a useful purpose or not? And I'm sure you know, so far the courts generally have looked at these projects and seen that they are useful, but I'm sure at some point someone's going to come up with a project and the court's going to say, you know what, no, this is not useful. This is, does not have uh, the purpose, the purpose of this project is not, does not serve the ultra, ultimate purposes of, uh, of the copyright system or of the public. Similarly, with respect to the fourth factor, the courts have been looked at very carefully to see if there is, does this specific use have a market impact? And so far, they've found that, that, that it hasn't. Uh, that's, but, but, but Jan, to go to your example of the 50 books, I mean, I'm sure if someone did that, there's no question that the court would say, yeah, that has an adverse impact on the market, and that is not permissible. I mean, I don't see how you know, that could possibly, you know, what you described could possibly be a fair use. Um, uh, and by the same token, uh, you know, the second factor, the nature of the work, I mean, Ben talked about you know the travel books, and and you know, uh, uh, but but I, but if you you know, in in the in the in the case where you in the in the Reed Elsevier case I mentioned where they did provide allow full access, but it was full access to briefs. It was full access to uh, 
works that, in a sense, did not have any commercial value. I mean, these were briefs filed in court. Uh, they were never sold, other, I mean, or you could say actually they were sold for a very expensive price, right? I mean, you know, the lawyers that, that produced them charged, you know, you know, you know, charged an awful lot of money for, for producing those briefs, but they were not commercial products in the normal sense. And so the court, again, found that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the purpose of allowing other lawyers who have access to these databases to, act, you know, to, to be able to access all these briefs and benefit from the, the research and the analysis in those briefs justified uh, 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 the, the access. But my point is, is that the fair use allows the case-by-case -case granularity uh, of inspection that it's really hard to imagine that any legislation would ever do any better at, and so uh, it, it seems that um, that that it is the 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 perfect solution to this problem, or at least a better solution than any other solution that is likely to emerge. And I think even the security issue can, you know, a court can factor in to say, does this is this person going to be providing adequate security or not? And if they aren't providing adequate security. The, the court can, you know, well, the, well, the actually, four factors are not, you're not limited to four factors. The court can consider whatever else it wants. I, I guess I had one kind of follow-up question, and we can open it up, too. But the, the, the key distinction, of course, with fair use is that there is no payment at the end. It would be a complete, um, you know, affirmative defense to copyright infringement. Uh, so I think the one thing that we're struggling with is whether, um, you know, there can be a flexible kind of solution that would actually still allow for some type of compensation or permission or involvement of the content owner in terms of what kind of uses should be allowed. Uh, I want to go back to what is mass digitization because I take a very different position from Professor Carroll. I think it's simply turning other formats into digital form. Beyond that, we all have different concepts of what mass digitization is. And they don't agree with each other because everybody looks at it from their own perspective. Some people talk about the value that they add um, and the circumstances under which they do it. And that's all legitimate, but that is not a universally accepted definition. So one of the things you'd have to do in legislation going forward is to embellish what's meant by mass digitization. And the courts will have to do that if it progresses under fair use as well. Um, I think the reason for distinguishing between orphan works and mass digitization is that the mass digitizers don't want to review work by work. They feel that what they're doing needs this comprehensive collection of works, and therefore they cannot effectively do that if they have to, in fact, do any investigation. But the flip side of that should be that, indeed, they get fewer privileges and possibly also have to pay if that's what they're doing. Uh, as far as um, the, uh, the, the point about Section 107, I think Section 107 is too vague and it's too... Um, uh, really address these issues, and I think addressing them through 107 is distorting the law. Um, the, um, the point about we can't uh, deal with security, for example, or we can deal with it just as well under 107 as we could under new legislation, I don't think that's right. And if you go back and look at what the Section 108 study group did, they, um, in the context of allowing libraries, uh, recommending that libraries be allowed to copy, to digitize for preservation purposes, they laid out a number of standards of what libraries should have to be able to do in order to do this preservation copying. And they tried very hard to use standards that were already out there in the industry and to use standards that wouldn't be ones that would uh, not be susceptible to change over time. And I think with respect to security, they just said uh, employ something like a standard security apparatus to control access. So I think that can be done. But the fact that they have to employ security ac apparatus is what is missing in Section 107. And finally, I just want to say the point about that we made earlier about one of the great things about mass digitization, it makes works available that uh, aren't otherwise or haven't otherwise been available. Um, that's certainly true now, but you know, I, I just don't understand what's going to happen going forward. So if something's already been made available through digitization, what happens then? Is the next person not allowed to do it? What about the works that come out that are digitized? Are we saying we're only dealing with legacy works here that have been created in other forms? I would be very surprised if most of the people around that table would agree with that. So I think it's, that's um, 
true now, but I don't think that that's a, a, a limitation that people would want to put on uh, mass digitization. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, so I, I guess I just have a very different perspective. I think, I think Ms. Bezik's uh, example shows the point that, that, Google, that fair use has a role. It is not the whole role. Um, and in fact, the fact that people talk about Google Books when they're talking about the licensed portion shows that Google uses snippets up to the fair use line and then it engages in licenses uh, to get the full value out of the investment that it's made in digitizing those works. And that's what I expect the institutions of memory and the cultural institutions would also have an interest in, that using fair use up to the point where they can, but then looking for a licensed solution for broader access. And, and then the question is whether the parties can negotiate those licenses or whether th there's a market failure such that those uses beyond fair use um, need a, a statutory license. And, and I, don't, I haven't ha heard enough evidence over the last two days to suggest that we have that kind of market failure at this point. The institutions of memory are, are not clamoring for the statutory license. Or if they are, it would be useful to understand what, what kinds of uses you want that, that license to cover, because I think that's the more productive dialogue. But I would also, again, urge, I think the Copyright Office can play a really useful role in uh, developing sophisticated registries that would make the, the scope of the orphan works problem going forward uh, a, a, a lot lower. And, and in thinking about what a registry is, you got to think about what digital technology is capable of. YouTube's content ID is a registry. It has a hash code that identifies works in ways that are much more effective than metadata, other, other kinds of metadata. So we should really be thinking about what digital technology can do to help us identify works going forward. Um, but we should also recognize that the, that the copyright owner enjoys the benefit of being able to take advantage of the, of the value created by the digitization because the digitizer will want to engage in a license conversation. Um, and, and then the last point about the security, just be careful about how onerous you think about making this, because otherwise it becomes the TEACH Act, right? Which I think would be a, a, an unfortunate result, where you're targeting the law-abiding institutions, because mass digitization is taking place by the masses, right? The seventh Harry Potter novel came out. That thing was in digital form before you could blink, and it was available. On, on all the textbooks are available via BitTorrent. That's all been mass digitized outside the scope of what we're talking about. So if you create a security apparatus only for the small number of targets that you can get your hands on, you're going to undermine the, the overall goal of moving 20th century culture online. Ms. Pilch? My comment was going to start with a similar uh, comment that, you know, we can talk about having an exception or a licensing scheme for libraries and archives, but in the meantime, the rest of the world is going about its business putting works online. And so we have to think carefully about how anything we decide relates to what else goes on under fair use or just goes on. But um, the real point I wanted to make was that before any conclusions are drawn as to, um, because I see the conversation being associated with libraries and archives, to the extent that mass digitization is going to be associated with the cultural mission of libraries and archives, it's important to say that I don't think that all libraries assume that they may or that their, their central mission is to, under fair use, put all works, uh, make all works publicly available to a global community. I think that many libraries understand that that's desirable but not necessarily possible, and they're willing to do it slowly, gradually, and to wait. Uh, we don't assume that we can do it right now. I think there are lots of lawyers um, out there now telling libraries and interpreting what libraries' cultural mission should be. Um, a recent uh, report that just came out um, is, is telling libraries that they won't be fil fulfilling their cultural mission if they don't digitize orphans. And, and I don't think that we always need people telling libraries what their cultural mission um, is. But uh, aside from that, I think it's really important for us to, when, it, when, when we come to a solution, when a solution is reached, to make very clear how the exception or the license, licensing scheme relates to fair use. I think that's becoming you know, a real issue. If, we, if there's a specific exception, and then there's a license possibility, or a specific exception or license possibility, and then there's fair use, 
we have the issue, why would anyone avail himself of a, f of a specific exception under certain conditions, under restrictive conditions, if fair use really allows you to do it anyway, um, and best practices or advising libraries uh, that it is a fair use to do it. May I, may I read from a fair use practice uh, that was uh, recently developed? It is a fair use to create digital versions of a library's special collections and archives and to make these versions electronically accessible in appropriate contexts. Now, regardless of what that means, libraries and li many librarians interpret that to mean it is a fair use. It's okay. We can do it. And so if we are... Again, why would anyone avail themselves of a specific exception, or why would anyone pay money to license if they are being instructed or encouraged uh, not to do that and that it would be a fair use to do otherwise? That, that's the real problem I see with the fair use argument. Okay, uh, Ms. Constantine, Mr. McDiarmid, and Mr. Ryden. I'd like to respond to a couple of people. Corinne, I'd like to... Um, educate you a bit on the, uh, the uh, commercial use aspect of some of these um, books that are involved in the, the mass digitization without authorization or compensation that Google did and that has to trust it. Um, and that is that a lot of these works are now coming back into uh, print digitally via contracts, via publishers realizing that these are lost gems and that there's a market there for a lot of the books that you claim have no value, no worth, because they weren't in print when they were digitized. Um, with respect to Janice, I'm going to take you out to lunch today because you sound like a reasonable uh, librarian, and <laughs> I haven't met one in a long time. Um, but I would take issue with one thing you said, and that is foreign countries are putting things online all the time. And in the Norwegian country, Norway and Sweden and other uh, Nordic countries, they are paying authors to put them online. They are not taking the position that they have a carte blanche to use all the books um, that in the literary um, marketplace of, of Nor the Nordic countries and putting them on without compensating authors, which is not what's happening in the United States uh, right now, and um, if, as you say, everybody assumes in the best practices, which I take issue with, that you can do it without, um, with impunity, why would anybody exercise any kind of a license and pay creators for anything if somebody is telling them, do it, best practices? And, and again, I warn you, if I find out about it, I'm going to sue you. Okay, and Can to just avoid say, a I back and forth, <laughs> excuse me, I just want to avoid a back and forth. We will all agree that there are a number of reasonable libraries and librarians, and as we've heard a lot from libraries today, um, you know, I, th this is not, an, a, you know, an attack on libraries or librarians because there are a, a lot of very, very good actors in that realm. Um, so I want to avoid any back and forth on that um, and avoid any back and forth between Corinne and um, Jan I'm for taking now. taking her out to and lunch. We'll go, uh, uh, and we'll go around the table, um, and, and uh, obviously if you have some a general comment, we can, we can address that in a few minutes. Thanks. I have uh, Mr. McDiarmid, uh, Mr. Ryden, and uh, Ms. Levine. Thank you. Um, we've reached a point in a long queue where I may be repeating some of the earlier comments, but um, I wanted to come back to the, the subject of breadth versus precision, and I think it's good on one hand that we're having a very broad conversation because we're talking about you know, very good things on both sides. We're talking about increasing access to creative works. We're talking about doing so while fairly compensating rights holders and, uh, and creators and treating them fairly. Um, when we turn to solutions, I think we may need to be more precise and think about solutions, plural, and not solution singular. Um, I tend to agree with a lot of my colleagues here that, uh, that fair use is doing some important work, and I, I agree with a number of those decisions. Um, I agree with some of the other people on the, on the panel that licensing is taking care of some of these things on one thing, but on, on the other end of the spectrum. But what we're talking about and what I think it's productive to talk about is that space in the middle where there is a publicly beneficial use, such as full text access, that is outside the bounds of fair use. I think, you know, large consensus that it would be outside the bounds of fair use but nonetheless serves a, an important public purpose. And I think that that is where sort of conversations about new licensing models or more specific targeted exceptions 
uh, could, could play a role. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Uh, I understand you have discussed Orphan Works, and June Bessig mentioned Orphan Works. At the same time, she also referred to mass digitization. Uh, just to, you might have discussed it, but if you haven't, it could be good to know that the European Orphan Works Directive, that when it was chiseled out, and you'll find it in the assessment report, the Orphan Works solution as it stands was not the only option. They, the EU Commission came to the conclusion to choose that one because of one very important aspect in Europe, cross-border aspect. But you'll find the assessment report many other solutions possible, and legal ones, and one was actually extended collective licensing. So the reason for the European Commission to say, oh, this is the solution, was the cross-border access, um, which is not uh, something you may have to consider. So I, I, anyone who would like to su study the European situation should go to the assessment report and not the final uh, directive. Actually, in one of the draft of, of the Orphan Work Directives, there was an Article 7. I think the Finnish government would like to want that introduced on ECL, but it was left out. So um, it might be very like look like a very, very well structured and focused solution, the European one. But as always, it's a political kind of com uh, compromise. And we have not yet enacted the Orphan Work Directive. It will have to be enacted by October this year. But one should also consider, regardless if you could refer to it as masterization or not, is that everything has a cost. A license has a cost, but also an orphan work solution, which in Europe is not an, a, an, a limitation, it's an exception. But still you have to have the manpower to do this diligent search, which is not cheap. And you'll have to pay for, most likely, some kind of register, because it says in legislation, either you do it yourself or you let someone else do it, and that might be Arrow. Is that free of charge? No. Uh, and Arrow is almost like his license. But at the end of the day, the orphan work trick does not provide legal certainty. A license does. Um, so there is a very short, thin line between the ECL solution and the orphan works directive. You study it carefully. Because the overall, the orphan work directive was monitored on Europeana, one access point to European culture. And that was actually about, actually about massization. But the focus was also on cross-border access. So if you, please, please bear this in mind when you study the European situation, if you do. Uh, you might draw different conclusions. Thank you. And I, and I will say we'll, we'll focus on the ECL model as a possible mm -hmm. solution um, in the next panel as well. So I want to respond to a few different things. First, um, I am primarily interested in libraries and memory institutions in this context. I recognize that Orphan Works is a much broader issue, but trying to map the universe is, doesn't seem particularly productive, at least for me personally. And I've been looking at these issues for 20 years now. It's really hard to believe that much time has passed and that we're having a different version of the same conversation. I want to say that, um, like many of my colleagues, we keep coming back to the same cycle of conversation, and we are really eager to continue to move forward in a productive way. So I greatly appreciate the ongoing tenacity of the Copyright Office in, in fostering these forums. I don't think that any of the special pirate organizations have filed to participate in any of the roundtables, and they may not be here to speak for themselves. And I am a little tired of what verges on Anne Hobbenham attacks on libraries and other um, honest brokers for a variety of, of institutions and positions. Um, I work at a university now. I used to work at the Library of Congress. I've worked at the Smithsonian. I worked at the World Bank. I have worked with creators. I've worked with publishers. This is a tremendously complex ecosystem, and every single one of us already recognizes that. Um, I think that many of the specific elements that June mentioned make a great deal of sense. Um, Ms. Penrose mentioned uh, some of the aspects of 108 and the role of museums. It's interesting. I know June served on the Section 108 committee, and one of the few areas of pretty easy agreement was that museums should be included in, in some way in, in, in the umbrella that libraries and archives are already uh, recognized. 
Um, I also, uh, you know, this can go many different directions. I think that um, particularly for, say, June and Professor Carroll, as law professors, I think any of these due diligence standards create sort of the permanent IP lawyer employment act of 2000 something, if we get to that. And, um, you know, university libraries used to not have copyright officers, whatever scholarly communications officers. There's already a, a, a very serious and considered um, investment in treating the stewardship we have very, very seriously. And it is not a dismissive kind of thing. It is not a light kind of thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's a book or it's a film. I mean, here, I haven't met uh, Mr. Desi, but I used to work on the American Memory Project. And what's so striking are things like the, the film collection here at the Library of Congress, which is cared for, a very complex preservation material that goes back over 100 years. It's cared for at public expense, but the copyrights are either unknown or they are known, and when a filmmaker or producer wants to assert rights or license the material, it's done in a, in a partnership sort of way with the Library of Congress. So there's this, in a sense, a public-private partnership where the film simply would not otherwise exist. There are a lot of materials, as many of you know, that are now historical. They were commercial materials when they were deposited as part of the registration process over the last 100 plus years. Um, and we would not have them but for that deposit process. And I, I, that, it's, it's a bit of a digression, but it's an important one. Um, copyright and collections have worked uh, integrally for well over 100 years. The United States has not always been a beacon of copyright protection. Um, we have a lot to protect now, and we need to be responsible about it. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, I had the privilege of helping to uh, produce a comment that was filed by the American Bar Association um, IP section. Um, I'm the chair of the copyright policy section. There are a number of people who helped participate in, in preparing that uh, last year. Um, despite the difference of perspectives reflected among the lawyers, uh, I think it, it's actually one of the pieces of writing I'm most proud of because it was, um, it, there's so much conflict. And I think Mr. Osterreicher's comment that, you know, uh, in the last panel where if you have a difference of opinion, you start with a phone call, seems like a very prudent uh, approach to much of this. Mr. Band. Uh, so two things. First, I wanted to uh, respond to, to Janice's reference to the best practices. You know that you grossly oversimplified. You just read the high-level principle. There's a lot of detail that gives a lot of nuance about factors that explain, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that really flesh it out. And so it's simply the notion that, uh, that the best practices are sort of a green light to sort of just scan everything uh, in the library is, is simply not accurate. Um, uh, second, um, uh, with respect to what Andrew was saying, I mean, I think that that's a very important point, that, you know, there's uh, fair use takes you you know, has its role, licensing has its role. Uh, clearly there's a gap somewhere. Uh, the big concern uh, with many of us about saying, okay, let's figure out how to fill the gap uh, is that um, inevitably the, the gap, what is seen as the gap, we, we disagree on what's the gap, right? And so I think what I see as the gap and what Jan sees as the gap are two very different things. And so I think what, what Jan sees as the gap would cover almost everything that I consider and my clients consider to be fair use. So that, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the legislation that would be filling the gap would result in, uh, you, we, we could in, end up being a, a framework that would require uh, you know, the libraries and others to pay for uh, into a collecting society a large amount of money for the kinds of scanning that we would otherwise consider to be fair use. Now, you could say, oh, it's going to be designed with it, but I have a feeling, you know, there's going to be inevitably a lot of gray area and there'll be a lot of fighting. And certainly, the, the uh, 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 you know, the rights holders will be pushing that the that, that what would be covered would, would, it would inevitably result in a lot of money being paid into a collecting society, which then, and, and this is really going to be the subject of the next panel, uh, 
But the truth is, very little of that money is really ever going to go to any authors. And, and so anyone who thinks that somehow these collecting societies are going to be this pot of gold for the individual author, that's not going to happen. I mean, most of the money is somehow going to end up being spent up top and not get filtered down, or will get filtered in a way that no one's going to know. Uh, and, and so that's the concern that a lot of money gets paid without much benefit. Could I just say two things? And really, it has to do with the next panel. Yeah, yeah and I will say we, we have to, um, we're getting really close to the end. We do want to see if we can have an opportunity for a few comments from the audience. We might not have those. 30 um, seconds, that's yeah, all. But 30 seconds, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. I just want to say that, you know, for a year and a half of my life, I spent sitting down with Google publishers and on Google's shoulder were the libraries because they weren't allowed in the room by Google. And we came up with the Book Rights Registry, which I believe to be the solution, which we'll talk about at our next session. It was not a collecting society. The money went down all the way to the creators and the authors. And you know, we can sit down at a table and talk as long as there's permission, there's a recognition of control, and there's compensation at the end of the, the, the day. Okay, we are going to open it up for audience questions. If anyone has a question, I see one. So uh, my name's Brandon Butler, and I helped to write the best practices that Janice was talking about a while ago. And so I wanted to clarify something really quickly. I think folks around, around the room might disagree about the import of the document, but I want to make sure there's just a fact of the matter about where it came from, right? And the fact is it took us two years talking to hundreds of librarians in all kinds of contexts, and not a word in that document doesn't come from the library community. So to the extent that you disagree with it, and you're a librarian, you're in the minority. Thanks. Just uh, very, very briefly, I think there's been a lot of discussion of mass digitization of books. Sorry, Hope O'Keefe uh, Library of Congress. And um, I guess you don't, you, you're, not, you're not opening this up for comments, but I, I'm, I'm curious to hear about a different kind of mass digitization, particularly mass digitization of manuscripts and historic manuscripts um, as, as something, we covered this in our comments, that really needs to be addressed uh, in, the, in any solution. And, and we, we don't have an opportunity to really open it up for comments right now in the oral portion, but um, as most of you know, we have requested additional written comments after these panels to respond to anything that was raised. So we would encourage people to um, respond to those issues or any other issues in writing that we haven't been able to explore in detail today or yesterday. Nancy Copans, Ithaca, um, just to point out that so much in mass digitization depends on the business models and the purpose of digitization, the scope, the audience. Is it mass digitization for preservation? Is it for on-site only? Is it for worldwide access? Is it a fee-for-service model? All of these factors um, weigh on permissioning and interests of rights holders. Uh, Brad Holland from the Illustrators Partnership. Um, I just wanted, I, I noticed this gentleman here was commenting on the high cost to mass digitizers of the cost of mass digitizing work. And I just wanted to comment that that, that confirmed what we said yesterday about the high cost to individual creators of digitizing our work to be in compliance with the Orphan Works Law. So that if the Orphan Works Law were passed, compliance would be so impossible that most artists would be unable to comply with it. And if Congress passed uh, both an orphan works law and a law that permitted mass digitization, we'd essentially be talking about the transfer of an enormous amount of private property from the hands of creators into the hands of corporations who have the money to engage in that kind of mass digitization. Hi, I'm Carrie Devra, and I identify myself these days as the Center for Copyright Integrity. But I think it's important to share that in a room filled with suits and people that are paid to be here, I am actually the arts content creator who made a living from age 19. You're talking in terms of arts, actors, and content. You're talking about people with passions that don't get the monthly paychecks you get to appear everywhere, and they have the same expenses that you do. In fair use, I have to remind you Number four says if you deprive the content creator of their ability to make a living, 
It's not fair use. So when we're talking about ways to accommodate these new exploding business models, we need to remind these people that there are laws on the books. Title 17 is fi followed by what I love to tell people, title, title 18, the criminal code. If you steal and take something that belongs to someone else, it is a criminal behavior. When you are approving what Google is doing and the private companies that run the internet, you are approving some entity that is complicit to a crime. And I only want to point out, there's a gentleman to my left here who is uh, site challenged. And in terms of a piece I covered and wrote about earlier, there is the misconception that people without site want to take, want to not pay for what they're being given. There's the um, Marrakesh Treaty, which I have followed and participated in. And the head of the WBU said something I think is important for all of you to hear. He said, we don't want to be treated differently than anybody else. We want to be treated like you. So these encouragements for the blind and other speak to the people instead of just the suits here. And I would encourage you, I am on a later panel, but in future panels, there are more arts people like me that understand these laws that you decide for us and deprive us of our content. If you feel so strongly that the models you're proposing work, then I'm asking all of you at the end of your months, give me your paycheck because you're taking away my money. Um, my name is Jean Dryden, and I represent the Society of, of American Archivists. And I would uh, just, going back to the beginning, the meaning of mass digitization, for archivists, uh, up to now we've been cherry picking items um, for digitization and making available online. But the meaning of someone's collection of, of papers or records is in the whole, and it's increasingly important to us that we digitize the whole thing. And in that, those collections, there's an awful lot of orphan works. So that's a, a, a perspective about the meaning of mass digitization that I, I don't want to be lost. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carrie Russell from the American Library Association. I just wanted to comment that verbal threats of lawsuits to libraries are, is not a really a good plan for getting us to negotiate with you. <laughs> it's worked before. <laughs> Uh, again, on, on that up, 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 uplifting note, um, no. um, we're going to break for lunch where everyone can uh, feed themselves, get some more energy for the later afternoon panel. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.